Where'd Patrick go? How long have you been doing this rug thing? Uh, like three, two or three years. Let's give Patrick a round of applause because that is awesome. <laughs> Thanks for doing it and thank you for letting me come give a talk at like the last minute, which is to say I'm totally unprepared and we're just gonna give this talk together. Um, yeah, so this is gonna be a conversation. I'm gonna ask questions and probably piss Frank off. So expect to talk without the microphone. Where's Frank now? All right, great, he didn't hear that, excellent. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, this is uh, the Ruby meetup, so I am definitely of less than average intelligence in this room. Uh, that, was, that was for you guys, so be, be kind. And there's real code here, so I just finished like a long sprint of uh, doing some crazy stuff with Active Job, uh, Rails 4.2 stuff. I had not prepared this code for this talk, so you're gonna see real code, and you should totally yell at me if uh, you have any thoughts on just how bad it is. It's terrible. Thanks, Frank. You're welcome. Um, so yeah, so who else like actually written job code? Any kind of job code? Mm, not as many as I kind of expected. Uh, okay, so who else on Rails 4.2? Okay. Great, and who else actually used Active Job? Okay, cool, great. Uh, so why do we do background jobs in the first place? It seems like that might actually be an interesting question. Um, and it's because we love our users' money. Um, it's a user experience thing. Like you don't want to, you don't want to have them waiting on, uh, with a web request while you're while you're waiting on some crappy third-party uh, email thing um, to actually send your email. Um, so why Active Job? Um, so Active Job is really cool because it lets you write to an interface. So interfaces are cool, right? We all remember our Java days, interfaces, interfaces, interfaces. No, it's really cool because you don't tie yourself directly to uh, rescue, sidekick, K. Uh, there's plenty of uh, adapters. Actually, let's look at uh, the list of adapters and, uh, real quick that are just built into Rails 4.2. Uh, yeah, back burner, I don't even know. Delay job is the classic one. QU, I'm not going to imagine pronouncing it. Uh, Sneakers, sucker punch. Um, a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of job engines, and it's really cool that uh, you can, they, that all of them can kind of uh, easily be swapped. Um, so the really cool thing, though, is for gem writers. So a really good email service like Mandrill might actually leverage this and automatically send emails in the background for you because they know that you're on Rails 4.2 or greater, and they can write to this interface. Now they don't have to care what kind of job queue you're on. Uh, you could have written your own, it doesn't matter. Uh, but so basically the ecosystem can become better behaved individuals, uh, expecting you to write an app better than we used to, better than a lot of those other frameworks and communities out there. Uh, does anyone know, there's actually a lot, a lot of controversy around that though, I think, uh, I think. I think I remember there being controversy. Uh, you know, because queuing engines are different, they expose different options. Does anyone actually know if a, a salient reason that this was bad or that active job is controversial? Okay, it's not controversial at all. It's awesome. You should totally use it. I think the first API was, was bad, so they removed it from an earlier release of Rails. And then right. It was going to come out in a much earlier version, right? And they, they finally came out because they had to reuse it. Yeah. Um, the concept of active job is the Oh, they didn't do a good job of interfacing, basically? It, it, it wasn't vague fully. It was yeah. How does it run under password? Uh, I mean, it's kind of a different concern. So, you know, you're... So, have you managed workers and, like, job queues? You mean, you may... The passenger doesn't like any of it. Doesn't like any of it. <laughs> yeah, the question was, how, how does it run under passenger? Um, and so, I, I think of that as kind of orthogonal. Uh, you know, how, how do they get run? Uh, well, how does your job get enqueued? So that's, a, that's the question. That's what the interface actually is, is, hey, I've, I want to do this job later. Uh, job, enqueue yourself. Or, you know, hey, adapter, enqueue this job. Some of them get enqueued into your database alongside the rest of your data. Some of them may get enqueued into Redis or some other data store, or, they may, or you know, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, so ideally, passenger doesn't come into the picture, and then some other runner, maybe on a different box entirely, wakes up later at a later moment and says, and pulls the job out of the same data store um, and gets to work. You know, you could. So actually, I've heard uh, Torque Box. Is that the uh, Rails thing from the? It's Red Hat, right? Yeah. Yeah, but it's a JRuby. It's 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 Rails running on JRuby. 
they actually have a really cool thing where like when you say run this later, it just forks a thread right then and there and, and runs it. Like everything's still in scope. Like it doesn't even have to like rehydrate models and stuff at a later moment. It just runs. So uh, this is a rich subject, I guess, is the point. Like there's there's any number of uh, execution models you could do your jobs. But that's really cool because then you know it forks the thread. So this thread goes ahead and gets back to the user and says, here's your page, while it sends the email and another thread. And, but you don't have to worry about coordinating variables. That always sounded really cool to me, but I'm not about to bite that whole thing off. Um, just like starts a Rails process and forks and then runs the jobs. It's Sounds like you course. need to give the microphone to Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Lindemann, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. Sounds totally worthy. No, it's not even that complicated. It just it's it's a way to keep that dyno free on Heroku. So when the Rails app starts, it forks off and forks off a sidekick process immediately. So wait, um, you, you, you rewrote a, f a premium feature of Slack to not pay them in a certain way on Heroku to not pay them? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Any of them, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we are all the uh, beneficiaries of that hard, hard hackery. So it's awesome. Uh, testing. So let's, uh, okay, so I guess I should actually show you code after I said I would show you code. Uh, so, so well, actually, let's look at a job. So, uh, I've got a. Where is my quick? There it is. Cloud copy job. So, uh, so it's just like a lot of Rails things. You inherit from a base class and implement a magic method. So, in this case, it's perform, and that's really all you have to do uh, to set your job up. And then you basically just call perform later on. What do you call perform later on? on the class. Uh, so yeah, you call perform later on a, on a class of a job, and, that and that's the magic. And you, you hand that perform later the things that you want perform to eventually be called with. Um, <coughs> where did cloud copy job go? Uh, and then it, it basically will call it later uh, with those same options, and that's where you can kind of do work. Uh, some, some queues could be implemented where it's actually not like, I mean, it's kind of weird. So and I've, I've worked in other, other languages, frameworks, et cetera. And not all job queues expect you to actually have the full, like, like the fact that Rails is in scope here is kind of crazy for some job queues. I mean, there are, you know, a lot of job queues will want to have no idea of the context, you know. So it's kind of interesting, but like, we get a lot of leverage from doing this. Like, so wherever that job, so it, sure, it's not passenger, it may be on another box somewhere, but you've got to also have your Rails environment deployed there as well, to, or at least accessible in that way, uh, if, if you want to just use all your models and whatnot. Uh, it's kind of tangential. Uh, but it's really cool to just be able to do that. Um, I was going to talk about testing. <coughs> so that perform method is really cool. So, so uh, there's two sides to it. There's basically I want to make sure that something enqueues a job when it's time. And I uh, rspec mocks really quickly. Just expect cloud copy job uh, not to receive or to receive. Here I see everything. Uh, or to receive perform later. And that's kind of where I want to stop. Like just. Make sure, and again, this is like I just wrote this a couple weeks ago and just got it working. So it's basically just like, look, I'm going to make a make a model, and I want to make sure that it goes ahead and enqueues things when I expect it to, enqueues jobs when I expect it to. Um, then how do I t uh, how do I uh, test the jobs? I do a cloud copy job uh, in my cloud copy job spec. Uh, I actually call perform myself, so I'm going to go ahead and new the thing up and actually call perform with some stuff. And you know, it's in the fashion of most wonderful code. It's a tiny little function, five lines or less, right? Uh, it's really easy to actually test and maybe mock out the, the few collaborators it has and see that it works. Uh, I had a problem, though, because the default, so by default, you, don't have a, you may not have a job adapter. And if, you know, you start a project, you don't. You don't actually have a worker queue to run these things. So it gets run in line, so, which is kind of neat, right? Like, you haven't installed the job thing yet. It just does what it did before except you get to feel good because you actually said enqueue this job, even though it actually happens in line right there and blocks the process. But later on, you can come back and add a queue. Um, that's really cool, but I actually found this to be a problem with testing because, you know, maybe it's a problem with active record callbacks because I'm actually doing this stuff as a side effect of something that's kind of probably unrelated. Uh, my verdict is still out on that. But, I, I, but suffice to say, when I'm running tests, I don't want all those jobs to run just because I created a whole bunch of photo models. So. I actually found it really easy to go and so so I uh, so the default is inline and uh, well, I forget why I named it this but I I basically wrote the later means never adapter so <laughs> it's just that easy like just don't just don't do anything whenever you get told to enqueue yourself just don't do anything um, and uh, that is only added in uh, 
test r b, right? Right, later means never. So that in there, because I follow the right module naming and everything, it's, it, looks, it looks like it's kind of built in. Uh, you know, should I release that as a gym where I did like less work than anything? Like, I think you should contribute that back to Rails. <laughs> yeah. Pull like, request. Troll them in an issue and get some heat around it. And, yeah, 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 totally. So yeah, it felt weird. It was like, well, that was fun. I don't know that this is value or not. And it's kind of my opinion. But you know, that's the interesting thing too, right? Like it finally came out. So people are finally using it. And you know, this room's not like 10% or less people are using it in here. Like people probably aren't using it yet. Maybe I did discover something that, you know, people are gonna come back and say, look, this is dumb. Let's stop running all our tests, all of our uh, jobs and tests. But it's kind of it's neat. It's, it's just kind of interesting that there's like a conversation around this again. I mean, kind of newly. I would think at least it needs to be a later means never gym. Okay. Seems like a really hard gem, but you're right. Uh, okay. Let me get back to my amazing notes. Uh, so, you, so you know, you you hand it a, an active record model. How does the later thing get the same thing, right? Like the it's the magic is happening, and then and then it gets called later as though it's still there. And that's where a system called okay, global ID comes in. So global ID, you know, is global ID new with 4.2? Does anyone know? Did it come with Active Job? It's uh, new. Yeah. new-ish, it's like new official. Ish. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people have been doing that pattern for years. Right. Yeah, it's had to be implemented because you need exactly this thing, right? So, well, now it's part of Rails. I believe it's official on 4.2. It might be 4.1, but it's, yeah. it's basically UUIDs instead of database sequence. Yeah, wherein I read you a readme file. Um, <laughs> so Active Model basically has it mixed in, so you can now call to global ID on your models. Uh, that will hand you a global ID object, and uh, you can get that back. So the, the, the actual string of the global ID is that, which uh, really simple. GID is a made up scheme by Rails people. It's really cool, you can do that. Uh, app is the name of your uh, application name, and uh, this is your model, and this is your ID. And you know, what's so interesting, like anyone could serialize to that. There's really not a whole lot interesting, it's just like, Again, standardization interfaces. Let's all just do the same thing, and things things will be happy and awesome. Uh, later, you can call locate, and th what what this thing does is it will actually hand you the model back because under the covers it calls find. So it's actually going to uh, piece apart the things, and it's going to call. It's going to call. Uh, that's the class it's going to call find on, and it's going to pass that at, uh, the one the ID. It's to, I mean, it does the thing that we do in Active Record all day every day. Um, so. That's it. So when you call perform with, uh, perform later with your job, it just it stores that instead. It global IDs with the thing, and then when it calls finally calls perform, it right before that hydrates the model and hands it in. I'm really looking forward to the whole class of security vulnerabilities when controllers fetch models in other places and bypass can can. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to this feature. On that note, let's look at some code. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so okay, let me see. Yeah, so yeah, it calls fine for you, and you know you could you could implement that pretty easily yourself, and actually leverage their thing. Uh, it's also swappable. You could uh, uh, some cool things you can do with it is uh, custom app locator, custom uh, custom serializer. So it does the it does the serialized thing if you want crazy long unguessable things, which I do in a moment for webhooks. I'll show you that, and uh, yeah. So you and uh, you can also pass. Uh, let me see where it is. Oh, there you go. It's got this four option. So those long, so those unsigned ones, you can actually make lot, lots of different ones, lots of different kinds of them. It's like added security. It's like a salt. Like, hey, this is for the sign-up form. So don't quite generate the same thing you would have. You know, throw this in there when you generate the crazy unguessable string. Um, so that's kind of neat too. And you got to pass that back, of course, when you're when you're pulling it back out later. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so webhooks. So what are webhooks? Webhooks are a common pattern where you expect, you know, it's it's like the opposite of an API. It's an API that calls you, uh, probably when they when they're finished processing some jobs with some kind of asynchronous process that's probably worker driven, um, or or maybe it's you know some other process you own, which is what I've got in my case. It's a totally different worker queue that does resizing of images, and that's not in Rails at all. But it's just kind of a dumb service that I post JSON to, and it posts JSON back. I need to do something with that. Um, so I've got a lot of models that are just derivative models. They're literally like, this is the thumbnail derivative of a photo. This is a small, this is a large, this is a print derivative. Uh, and I, so I, this is, um, this is potentially suspect, but I made a, so media derivative. Well, actually this, mm, so, okay, this is all crazy. So I've got this remote resizable concern, which is probably a little crazy. And then remote resizable uh, actually brings in another, the attached webhook concern. And let's see, attach webhook. Doesn't really do anything except call this find form method. So my webhook, uh, Sorry, I'm rambling, guys. My, oops. 
My webhook has this uh, find for method, which does no, just expects you to hand it a global IDable. And all it does is call to global ID on it. So you hand it anything that can be called to global ID, which is, guess what, every single one of your models. And the webhook will call global ID, store that, and store the, uh, store the signed thing, which is nice because now I can generate controller, I can generate uh, uh, routes. I can, you, can, you can call back to that. So uh, call URLs. So basically you can call webhook slash crazy unguessable thing. My webhooks controller will grab it. It'll go look up the webhook by that crazy unguessable thing. It'll rehydrate the model. And then it'll say, hey, model, process this, this webhook. Here's the payload I got. And that was like really simple. Um, again, I'm not proud of the code you're looking at, but it was really quick and, dirty, uh, quick and easy to put together. And it's well tested. And it's all just working. Yeah, Frank, t tell me why I shouldn't do it this way, quickly. My thought is, without testing it, is that there's a vulnerability here because um, you are taking user-supplied input and fetching arbitrary records from any model, assuming that someone has observed. So there's no prevention of replay attack. So if I observe like this global ID through another part of the app, um, and then I'm able to inject it through another part of the app that doesn't do access control correctly, I suspect that I can do nefarious things. You do that for free, right? Like you like security audit my stuff for free, right? It's not like a thing you make money on Let's or anything. Talk after. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's really easy to blow your leg off with all the new cool tools in Rails 4.2. Um, and now here we are. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll show you what I actually built with it because it's probably worth 100 million words. Uh, so someone do the sacrificial thing to the demo gods to make sure I don't mess this up. You know what I'm talking about. So uh, I work at a real estate uh, photography company and we're working on, right now we sell to photographers, we're now trying to sell to agents directly and this is like hyper alpha, not even alpha. The thing we finished to finally kind of show things off. So, uh, so it's really quick and easy. So basically it's just like, give me an address, Tell me about this house. Upload a bunch of photos. Um, uh, you know, I probably shouldn't go through all this because it's boring. I'll just uh, edit the one that I have because it shows off. Um, this is also an Angular app, much to my chagrin. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> it's been really painful, uh, but it's pretty cool. So OK, so I'm going to upload some photos. Uh, quick sidebar about FilePicker.io. Does anybody use FilePicker.io? We probably won't at the end of the day because you know it's someone else's branding right here in the middle of our site. Maybe we will. I don't know. This thing's amazing. Like you just hand, you go set it up and give it some S3 keys, and it will do cool stuff for you, which I will now show you. So I'm just going to throw like a bunch of photos in, and nice uploader. And once they're all kind of done, it oh, what just happened? I'm oh, sorry. So they should have popped right in there. They're not because they're waiting on my Rails app to call uh, the cloud copy job because I left it in line. I haven't added rescue yet. It's just not done. So here they are finally coming back after S3 has responded. Um, so I, you know, ideally, at the end of the day, I just add rescue, and it's DevOps's problem then. <laughs> and this whole thing just works. <laughs> um, having a DevOps guy is awesome. So let's preview the tour now. And so here's the other thing. The, this is the photo. This is one. The, the last photos haven't finished processing yet, so I haven't actually got the large ones yet. So let's jump over to, uh, and we'll. Look, this is my back end. We'll look at the web hooks. Uh, actually, maybe they all just finished processing. Yeah, they did. <laughs> they probably did. Yeah, they did. Let me upload one more, and we'll watch it finish. Actually, the workers might still be awake, and this might totally fail. Let me put a bunch more in there. So look at my webhooks, and there. So, I, so I'm, I'm like logging the recent activity straight into the database record. I'm sure Frank can tell me why not to do that as well. Um, we'll, we'll we're, you know, we're getting uh, log stash and all that set up, and soon it'll be a proper place for it. But uh, in just a moment, they will, as, as the webhooks get called, they will uh, get put back. You know, I, maybe this is a terrible idea. I don't know. I mean, having a database row for every webhook, but it strikes me. That, I mean, I was able to do it pretty quick with the global ID stuff. Um, and it, there's also some cool views that you can make, right? Like. Uh, show me webhooks that have never been hit. And I'm like, why were those never hit? Why did I make them in the first place if they were never hit? That's interesting. You know, I you could just throw away the, the older ones or whatever um, there. So they're all filled in now, so I know it's done. Um, and this is just like a Rails admin plugin, right? Like I didn't write, there, there's no admin code been written by us, but I'll, I'll write a nice admin that will, you know, manage all the webhooks and give, give us visibility into 
uh, what's actually happening with them. So that's really all I have. Hey, Bryce. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I, uh, I do have another thing that actually is totally unrelated. So you guys can suck it. Uh, I should probably log in, huh? Do I see my talk on this already? Uh, so I'm working. So I, so my side uh, company is Oil and Rope Games, and we work on tabletop games because I'm sick of programming computers all the time. And then I decided to go ahead and program computers to help people make tabletop games. <laughs> so here we are. Um, uh, so basically, this this is um, I totally didn't uh, plan to talk about this, and it's not even using Active Jobs. So this is just me talking about myself. Um, so. If you're making board games, you should be making them with a spreadsheet. You should be tracking all your assets in a spreadsheet. Um, because you need to iterate. If it's going to be any good, you need to play it and find out why it doesn't work at all, and then go make changes, and then print your cards again. So people, ma people make what's called print and plays. So, but this is a huge pain of a process of like, uh, the, the advice you're going to get if you ask the World Wide Web what to do with your spreadsheet that you need to turn into a PDF is learn InDesign. And that is like, you know, not nice. You do not, you know, you should be designing games, not, uh, not graphics. Uh, so we're writing a tool that makes this easy. So, so you can just take my word for it that this uh, spreadsheet is uh, something that I made by hand. And you can download this as a CSV. I've got a Google Sheets integration, but I don't want to trust that everyone gets that. Uh, I know this crowd does, but. So this is, th this is a love letter game. Add a deck, it just wants a CSV. Drop it in there. I've got a fantasy and a sci fi motif. We'll start with fantasy. Bam, it's been uploaded. And now here's all the CSV columns. Yeah, uh, Ernie did some CSV stuff, so I just want to show him up real quick. Uh, so here's all the CSV columns. Uh, Quantity is a magic column that will actually make most multiple cards. Uh, rank, I'll put it to. So there's like numbers over here to see where they are. You probably can't read it. Uh, the rule goes down in the big bucks, which is four, and then actually there is image support. So you may have noticed there is a row of URLs here. And I'm going to save that, and I'm going to make a PDF. So here's another long running job that I told you all not to ever do, and I did it in line there. So uh, bam, there's a print and play. So you can print this on your printer, chop it up with a guillotine, sleeve it with your old magic lands that you're not using anymore, then you can shuffle up, deal up, and play your uh, game prototype. Um, this is actually a real game called Love Letter, and I just didn't want to actually rip them off entirely, so I stole. So I ripped off Flickr and stole dog photos. Um, yeah, but that's like another obvious like job for you know. If there's a, so there's a lot of interest in this, like a lot of game developers, get, board game developers want to use this um, based on a tiny little video I made. Which, if you really want to see how it all works, you can go check it out at uh, oilandrope.com/paperize. Um, New Relic actually like wrote me an email and was like, "You've got one request. That's like eight seconds, dude. What are you doing?" It's like you found my PDF generation request. That's absolutely a problem and totally will never scale if I ever let anyone use this. So I'm about to have to go and you know make it a separate server that'll make these uh, PDFs. And uh, you know, thank you, New Relic sales guy. He doesn't care anymore because the free trial, the pro trial's over, and I didn't buy. So he's he's not watching my analytics <laughs> anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, Anyway, so I, I, I'm about to, I'm about to uh, kind of build that out. And you know, live previews would be great. Like what you saw there. Uh, here, this isn't live. And this, so you know, PDFs on one side, and like this is like web stuff. It's not even, nothing's happening here. But I need there to be live previews so you can kind of work faster. I have no idea how to like do jobs fast and send a PDF rendering to the front end or something. Or do I need to like image magic some slices out of a PDF? They don't want to render it twice, once as P HTML and once, I mean, I'll, I'll, that will never remain in sync, right? So anyway, that's, a, that's an issue I'm dealing with, if anyone has any thoughts. Now I'm really done with my talk. GPUs. GPUs? Yes. Like, shitloads of GPUs? Yes. Okay. That's how you <laughs> render hardware. Oh. Oh, hardware is the problem? Is there a GPU in the jail? Well, there, Amazon will sell you GPU time, so I mean. <laughs> There's the HTML, the PDF, like, binary. Do you know who Patio11 is? Patrick McKenzie? He actually commented on the Hacker News and was like, do not do HTML to PDF. You know, he did the bingo card creator, so he's like, don't do HTML to PDF. So I was like, you may have just saved me weeks of work. So <laughs> thank you. What were you saying, Blake? No, I, I didn't know if there was a utility that did that. But that's yeah, there, there, there are, and I actually heard good things, but 
than the guy who's actually dealt with yeah, it. Yeah, script libraries to generate PDFs now. Yeah, that's interesting too, right? So how about we just like pull an Apple and just don't support PDFs? Apple doesn't support PDFs? No, I mean like the oh, yeah. Flash, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. How else am I going to get like print ready things? True, I guess so. Games. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Anybody have a question or want to talk about anything? Last chance. Active job is awesome. So have you used other queuing systems, and how does it compare? Well, um, how does Active Job compare? Like, yeah. Did you have any problems? I mean, it's dead simple. I mean, I, that's my, kind of my fear is the only thing is it may not have, it may not expose a feature of some crazy cool queuing system that I am unaware of. Um, but it can, it's got, it, it supports queues, so you can name the queues, so you can have priority queues, like always send my emails really fast, but if I'm doing these PDF things, don't let those get in front of my emails. Like, so, yeah, and you can also say run this later, uh, run this at, in two weeks, run this whenever, that kind of thing. Uh, hopefully I. Yeah, we have it, it's kind of like, I think we're like five or six. Okay, it's all right. Wow. Uh, we added it to like five or six apps on assembly, and they all seem to work like really well. It was really easy. What are you backing it with? What? What's the job queue that you're actually using? There are a few that were like delayed job or something, and then Sidekick was most of them. Yeah. And with like even with like weird Sidekick extensions and stuff, all of that seemed to work just fine. So. Right. Yeah, it's really powerful to have just simple abstractions, right? Like just stop stop writing straight to a queue. They're all the same, just kind of using different terminology or different invocation styles. So wrap that up. Way in the back. What's the uh, main use for Ruby? What's the main use for? Yeah, like what's like the main thing you would basically use it for? Use what for? Ruby. Ruby? Yeah. Um, and general, like pretty much everything. I try to slice bread with it at this point. Uh, <laughs> uh, like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, no, I mean, so I mean, Ruby. Uh, I'll make this as quick as I can. Ruby is like a, it was called you know it's called a scripting language, which was derogatory for a long time. Like, oh, scripting language, toy language, those kinds of things. But you can kind of do anything with it now. It's the idea of like, don't spend too much time optimizing things. It's the three rules of optimization. Don't optimize yet, don't optimize yet, and do not optimize yet. And it's basically like, right at the highest level you can, get work done to prove something is valuable until it stops you know, working. And if something's not going fast enough, then you can drop down and write something in a, in a, in a different language. Um, that's too heavy-handed. There are definitely reasons to not use Ruby for some job. I mean, there's there's like there's kind of like four classes of languages. Yeah, it's interpreted. You don't have to run a compiler first. Um, I mean, my, probably for a lot of people, the fir their first interpreted language is basic. If you go way back, and then as we move forward, you know, Python is interpreted. Ruby is interpreted. There, there's a lot of interpreted. Versus compiled languages, which are like C or other JavaScript is interpreted. So, so yeah. yeah, you can use it for anything, um, but it may it, you, you start doing more hardcore stuff, and it may be kind of the wrong idea. But that that kind of takes experience too. Really, the only the only strategy to to picking like the best language is to learn them all. Like, there, there's no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not holy about this. Like, there's, it's like, learn as many as you can. You'll write Ruby differently after you write something totally different. Or after you write Closure or something, like it will change the way you write Ruby, and that's a good thing. Um, so there's no like, there's no like pick one and stick with it forever, and, and you're good. Hope I'm not kicking anybody's baby in here. But <laughs> anybody else? Hey, Cobol was a real language. Still is, yes. <laughs> like I heard the air quotes in your sentence. Real language. No. All right, we're running long. Thanks. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.